And now part three of Kimmy Cantrell and careers in nonprofits. How about stories? Are stories helpful in, in the process to, to be able to tell a story about how they got a major gift or how they, they you know, saved uh, um, X number of dollars through some accounting technique or something like that? Great question. I would say yes. I know for me, I'm not going to remember the statistic that you give me, but I will definitely remember the story that you shared and like how okay. that related with me. Um, and so I think a lot of people feel the same. I think that it also shows that you can really put into practice the work you're talking about versus just, well, I did this, this, that, and the other. It's like, well, how, what did that look like? You know, how did that impact your customers? How did that impact your constituents? How did that impact your team? And so I think stories are a really great way to show, like actually show tangibly the work that you did and how that added value at that time. Okay. No, that's good. I, I'm a big advocate for stories too. I, I like to hear the context. I think it makes a big difference. And you're right, you know, humans kind of learn by stories. And so that's, that's helpful. Uh, are there any groups that you would recommend uh, joining as a, uh, as networking? I mean, we talk about fundraising, right? So there's AFP and AHP in case. Um, and if people want backgrounds in those, you know, just pop me a note or something, but, um, it, but other groups or particular groups that you think are helpful in networking? Well, this one's a great one. Um, <laughs> oh, yes, right. Our group, right. <laughs> yeah. um, this group's great. Um, but I there's honestly so many. And so their um, idealist.org is a very well-known site in the nonprofit sector for job postings, but there's also a lot of volunteer opportunities. And so um, I would say check out idealist.org. And that has a lot of opportunity of where you can look to network. Um, but it's going to be different per region. You know, I know I mentioned Candid earlier, which used hmm. to be foundation center in many different cities. Um, and in conjunction with the Center for Nonprofit Advancement. Um, they kind of merged together in the past couple of years. And I know that they exist here in DC. I know they exist in New York. I know they exist in San Francisco. In Philadelphia, yeah. They exist uh, all over the country. And so organizations like that are really helpful too. And they just provide a lot of different resources. But as you mentioned, you know, if you're in fundraising, AFP is the Association of Fundraising Professionals. If you're an association executive, there's ASAE, which is the Association of Association Executives. <laughs> um, but there is a association and a network for everything. And so if you can't find one, I would say you're probably not looking hard enough. Um, well, but actually, and now, now that I think of it, I have a list on my website. I, I don't mean to make this an advertisement, but, I <laughs> but there is. I, I, I actually came up with like 100 different associations that might be connected to nonprofits. So folks can find it on nonprofit yep. courses too. Absolutely. And so I would just say, go to Google and whatever it is you want to network with, Google that. And I'm sure you can find, you know, dozens of different outlets and resources. Um, and then the more that you meet people, the more that they will introduce you to other things and people, you know, they'll say, you know, oh, have you tried out this? And then you'll try that out and they'll say, oh, have you tried out this? And then it just keeps, you know, a continuous web of, of networking. Um, so you just have to ask. Yeah. So uh, are there things that job seekers shouldn't do at all? Like, don't do that. <laughs> Whatever that is. Anything comes to mind? Yes. We strongly recommend against putting a photo on your resume. Um, we Got just it. find that that in many different capacities creates for um, yeah. bias in many different ways, you know, yeah. regardless of, of what you're going for. Um, and I understand the reason behind it, but if they want to see your face, they can find you on LinkedIn, um, but we just don't think well, that. Well, with that in mind, then how about um, things like uh, dates of graduation from college, for example? A lot of people are moving away from that. Um, and, and honestly, we actually recently instituted a, um, our submission process where we take off even the institution that people graduated from as well as any um, gender pronouns. And so that way, and whenever we submit a resume, like if we were doing that with, with um, you, we would just put like 
the, your initials like MH with your resume. And so that way people don't have any bias. Not when MH they, old guy, huh? <laughs> right. Well, because if I say, you know, Matt, then obviously it's assuming that, you know, whatever somebody wants to assume from the name Matt is what they start to assume. And, you know, we did a, a long training as, a, as an organization about hiring biases and how even if we have the best intentions as a human, like everybody has them. Um, and so we help eliminate that for our candidates by taking that out of the equation. Um, but, but I think also too, you know, if you, you shouldn't be afraid, you know, to be who you are, because when you show up for a Zoom interview, they're going to recognize, you know, who you are and, and what, what you're coming to the table with. But I think if it's something that you're unsure about, like, you know. Well, so, so uh, something that's, that's come up broadly, at least here in Philadelphia now, I think the ordinance passed, where they're not allowed to ask your past salary history. Yep. Yeah, that's very happening a lot. And yeah. a lot of people still, for some reason on their resume, they'll put, you know, when they write an organization, what their salary was. And you just don't need to do that, you know? And um, how about just even asking that, or just uh, when, when a, will employers, will you work with employers that will ask that? Does it make any difference or not? Or We tip, because all of that goes through us, like it doesn't typically come up a whole lot. Like mm. very rarely will we have a client say, well, what were they making before when they're getting ready to make an offer? Right. Um, but we don't have to disclose that information. And so we often don't. And we say things like, well, you know, can't really disclose that information, but I do know that it's comparable with what you're looking to offer. Um, and so we just don't really directly answer the question. Um, yeah. but the only reason why, you know, that's really a, appropriate is one, if you are making $200,000 a year and this position offers $100,000 a year, they want to know because they are going to feel like if you take a hundred K pay cut, then you're not going to want to stay very long. Um, but also if you, if they're offering a hundred thousand and you were just making 50, well, why would I pay them a whole hundred if I could just make them 75 and they'd be so happy. Um, and so that's really the reason why people want to know. Um, but at the end of the day, if they have the, if they have the budget set out and they say the range of 80 to hundred K, like anywhere in there, you have the right and ability and authority to say that you want that. As long as you feel like that is worthy of what you have to offer. Now, if it's something that you're like, I could grow into, yep, I'm satisfied with 85. Like that's totally something you have to evaluate. Um, but if that is within their budget, like asking for what's at the top of it is totally within reason. Okay. Fair enough. Well, just a couple more things here. And this has been really good. And thank you so much for, for, uh, for the length, if nothing else, but also for the really <laughs> good information. Of course. So um, funny stories, horror stories, anything that like, you know, like, oh my gosh, I don't believe we did that. <laughs> or, or, oh, I can't believe that. Like, I mean, one time I did a interview uh, with somebody who was yawning the whole time. And it was like, oh my gosh, you couldn't have had a cup of coffee before you showed up? <laughs> <laughs> you know, honestly, there's a lot of things that when they finish, I'm just like, wow. You know, like, I just can't believe that happens. But I'm going to instead tell a story that was really, I think, adorable that ended really positively because I'm a positive person. So we're going to do some, <laughs> some positivity here. Um, but, but I love the story because it was one of the first people that I placed in a position when I came here at CMP. Um, and so a lot of times people feel like you said earlier, you know, do I wear the blue tie or the red tie? And a lot of people feel like they have to physically look the part when they go for an interview, right? They feel like they have to wear the perfect blazer and, you know, not wear too much makeup and wear the appropriate earring. And, you know, there's just so many um, stigmas into what you should look like for your interview. And so I was working with this candidate. It was a marketing and communication role. And um, the candidate was perfect. I mean, he was just the perfect candidate for this role. And he's going to his final round interview and he was very nervous about it. And it was raining that day. And so he called me and he said, Kimmy, I really need your help. And I'm like, okay, yeah, what's happening? You know, you need a ride? I'll come pick you up. What is it? And this was before COVID, obviously. Um, and he said, I've got this, you know, plaid normal tie, but then I also have this tie with um, babe, like miniature umbrellas on it and it's raining. And so I want to wear the miniature umbrellas, but I'm not sure if that's professional enough. Should I do it? 
And I know the client and I'm like, they will love your miniature umbrella tie more than anything. Wear that tie. And he wore the tie and he went for the interview. And when the client called me afterwards, literally the first thing they said was, oh my God, he had the cutest tie on and they ended up hiring him. And he just celebrated his four year anniversary um, at the beginning of this month. And so oh, that's cool. what, that, what that story means to me is that, you know, sometimes we think that we have to be like, a little stuffy or a little buttoned up for our interviews, which is true, you know, be professional, put your best foot forward, but also be yourself, you know, and he, he wanted to show that part of his personality of like, I like, like, you know, little miniature, little tiny umbrellas all over the boat, all over the tie. Um, and, you know, that to them that really stood out and coming into a marketing role, you know, it showed his creativity. And, you know, I just think it added a lot of value. Whereas, you know, a lot of people, try to tone those things down for interviews. And I just think that we should really be our authentic selves and we should really, you know, if they're not going to love you for who you are, then do you really want to work there? You know, yeah. and so that's really my biggest piece of advice in that scenario was like, sure, he could have worn the plaid tie and still looked just as great and probably still gotten the job because they just liked him who he was. But that just added a piece to his character, you know, and allowed them to see that just up front and it matched the, the, the rainy day. And then, you know, it was a beautiful story at the end, but oh, there's cool. a lot of stories. Don't get me wrong, but I, <laughs> I, try, to think about those. I try to think about the good ones. <laughs> so is there one last thing? Is there any, um, thing you would change about the process or if you had the, like you know queen for the day magic wand you know wanted to, to say boom this is different so now we can move forward what would it be that's a hard question for me because I'm a very like world peace kind of person you know like I, <laughs> I, you know when I first read that question I was like oh wouldn't unlimited funding be great but that's just not practical you know? <laughs> I think um I, I I think if I could really change anything it would just be I think attitude is everything and so many people they get into a job that's not really what they wanted it to be or you know we just always find a reason to to be upset or to complain or to feel negatively about things. And I just really believe that that's just not helpful. You know, like it can be a horrible circumstance, but your attitude around it has the ability to make it better or worse. And it, you know, being upset about things doesn't make it change. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't well, make it. That, yeah. That's a good lesson broadly as we sit here today on in November 2020. <laughs> right. You know, because you know, there's so much happening around us that we just have no control over. But what we do have control over is how we choose to show up and how we choose to care for people and love on people. And I just, you know, it sounds really mushy and you know, whatever, but that's gonna always be my what if I had a magic wand, I would just allow everybody to see just how grateful you know it it is to just be a human that exists right now and to just be on this journey where we get to try new things and sometimes fail, but those failures always turn into something better. And I just think, you know, um, recognizing that each day that you get is a gift. And, and that would be what I would do with my magic wand is, okay. is help people remember that, that each day is a gift and that it's just a really great opportunity to experience all the things that we get to experience. Fair enough. Thank you. I think that we all need to hear that. <laughs> like I said, especially now. Yeah. This is the end of our formal program with Kimmy Cantrell of Careers and Nonprofits. And I want to thank Kimmy for giving her time. I know it's valuable, especially these days when so much is going on in the world. And we really appreciate her talking to us about what it's like from the other side of an executive search firm, from her side as we're looking at candidates and clients and pulling all that together. Well, what you'll see next, if you choose to stick around, is the some questions and answers. I hope you enjoy them, get something out of them. Otherwise, thank you very much on behalf of Great Careers Bang and myself, Matthew Hug with Nonprofit.Courses. Make it a great nonprofit day.